We're gonna be back in the book of James, James chapter one, continuing the series that we're calling Faith Works. Uh, Last week, if you were here, we began this experience by hearing from James, and he challenged us when it came to facing trials in life. And here's what he said. He said, we will experience various trials in our life. I don't know about you, I've experienced some of those trials. But he said, those trials are coming in your life. And guess what? He was exactly right when he said that. Some of you can echo that right now. You can say, you know what? I'm walking through a trial today and it's tough. And guess what? James tells us it's possible to navigate various trials in our life and still do so in a way that leads to joy. He said that trials are coming, and yet through Christ, those trials can lead to joy. This morning, he's going to take us in a different direction. Remember, he's writing to early believers that are scattering all over the place. They're experiencing persecution because of their faith in Jesus, and now he's writing to encourage them. He's writing to encourage them in their walk with Christ, but he's also writing to warn them. And I just believe that as he wrote to encourage and warn these early believers in AD 45 to AD 48, that he's also writing to encourage and warn us today. So today, here's what he's going to tell us. He's going to tell us that Satan is active and that Satan is against you. And he's going to do whatever he has to do to derail you in your walk with Christ. He wants to derail you and he uses all kinds of different tactics to do so. Last week we talked about he uses the tactic of trials in our life to have us turn away from Christ. Remember, you're either going to walk more, you walk towards Christ or away from Christ when you face a trial in your life. And today as he continues in James chapter 1, he's going to talk about the tactic of temptation. Temptation is real, say amen, right? Temptation is real in my life and it's real in your life. John MacArthur once said, our biggest problem without a doubt in the Christian life is temptation. Think about it. Every sin we commit begins with temptation. Have you ever thought about it that way? Every sin that you've ever committed began with temptation, which tells us that this is a daily battle. It's a daily struggle, and if we can learn how to resist temptation in our life, if we can learn how to overcome temptation in our life, the Bible tells us that we are on the fast track to walking in victory. James is going to talk about that in James chapter 1 today as we begin reading in verse 12. It says, blessed is the one who endures trials, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. No one undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God, since God is not tempted by evil, and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. James knows exactly what he's talking about. You remember who James is, don't you? James is the brother of Jesus which means that he grew up sharing a bedroom with the Son of God. Think about that. He he shared a bedroom where he had bunk beds, right? James on the bottom, Jesus on top, because he wanted to be closer to his father. I just made that up. It's not true at all. (laughs) But he grew up watching Jesus, living with Jesus. Think about this. Remember how it goes. Mary gave birth to Jesus when she was still a virgin. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And so from the very beginning, Jesus was fully God and he was fully man which means he was perfect from the time he was born. He never sinned even when he was a kid. Some of you parents are thinking, man, I can't even imagine that, right? Having a perfect kid, never sin, never mess up. But the Bible says that Jesus was perfect, always has been. But as you can tell, as you read the scriptures, Mary and Joseph went on to have other children as well, and they had them in the natural way, the same way that you and I were born. So these would have been the brothers and sisters of Jesus, Or a little bit more literally, they would have been the half-brothers and sisters of Jesus because their father was Joseph and not the Holy Spirit. So Jesus and James, they were together from the very beginning. From the day that he was born, James grew up watching Jesus. He watched him navigate certain trials in his life. He watched him as he resisted temptation when the other kids on the playground were giving in to temptation. 
So he watched how to do life by watching, or he learned how to do life by watching Jesus. From the very beginning, he learned by watching the Son of God. And I just believe that we can learn a lot by doing the exact same thing. When it comes to things like resisting temptation, what better model is there than just watching Jesus and how he did so? If you have your Bible, I want you to flip over to Matthew chapter 4 real quick. Keep a a finger in the book of James, but also turn to Matthew chapter 4. I want to give you an example of how Jesus resisted temptation. And we see that in Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. It says, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Did you read that? Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, there's a lot to talk about in this one single verse, but right off the bat, I want you to see that Jesus was being led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, into the wilderness. Why? Well, look at it. To be tempted by the devil. That's why the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. You say, man, that sounds like a very strange thing to do. I mean, James just told us in James 1.13, no one undergoing a trial should say I'm being tempted by God since God is not tempted by evil and he himself does not tempt anyone. So what does that mean? Well, I want you to see God the Father didn't tempt Jesus, but he did allow Satan to tempt him. Which, which tells us this, and if you're taking notes, jot this down, that temptation doesn't come from God. Temptation that we experience, it doesn't come from God. It's kind of like what we talked about last week. We talked about how all trials don't come from God, but, but all trials come through God. He allows us to walk through trials in our life. It's the same thing with temptation. Temptation doesn't come from God, but but the temptation we experience has been allowed by God. And he allows us to experience temptation for several reasons. It's because he wants to test us, he wants to grow us, and he wants us to be mature in our faith. And that is a way of maturing us. So Matthew 4 says, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, before we go back to the book of James, I want you to take note of three different things we can learn from this scripture regarding temptation in our life. Three things that we need to know. The first thing is you can be godly and be tempted. You can be godly and be tempted. Jesus was fully God. And yet the Bible tells us that he was tempted in the wilderness. The second thing I want you to take note of is that temptation in and of itself is not a sin. Remember, Jesus was without sin. He was perfect, and yet he was tempted, which tells us you can be tempted without sinning. The third thing I want you to see here is that temptation is permitted by God. We just saw that in verse 1. God not only permitted him to be tempted, check it out. He actually approved it and walked him into the wilderness so that he could experience the temptation. So I just believe it's important for us to understand these three things. It's important for us to believe these three things because we get so bogged down at times because of the temptation in our life. Have you ever experienced that? It's like the devil keeps tempting you with the same thing over and over again and because the temptation is so strong in your life, you start believing the lies of the devil that say you are bad because you are tempted. Have you ever felt bad because you're tempted to do bad things? I feel bad because I am tempted. And I want you to see that that is not necessarily true. Temptation in your life doesn't mean you're bad. Temptation in your life typically means you're growing. I once had someone tell me, "Ah, Jordan, I wish I was a pastor. I wish I was, well, I wish I was like you so I didn't have to be tempted by the devil anymore. I started laughing. I thought it was the funniest thing I've ever heard in my life. I was like, are you kidding me right now? Listen, you think just because a person's a pastor or a a strong believer or a, a leader in the church that the devil's not coming after them anymore, it couldn't be any farther from the truth. In fact, here's the thing. The closer you are with Jesus... The, the, the more the devil is going to attack you, or put it this way, the better friends you are with Jesus, the greater enemies you become with the devil. You love Jesus with all your heart. You make it the top priority in your life to make much of Jesus and to point other people to, toward him. Guess what? The devil's coming after you because he hates you and he hates what you're about. And guess what? If you were the devil, you would do the same thing. You would go after everyone that loves Jesus as well. 
Reminds me of a story I heard about a couple of duck hunters. They were on the water. Now, one of the guys was lost as could be. This guy cursed like a sailor, drank like a fish, made every bad decision you can make. Far from the Lord, okay? He was lost. But he was duck hunting with a buddy who loved the Lord. I mean, this guy was a Christian. He was a Bible-toting, Jesus-loving, church-going. I mean, he was just the epitome of what it looks like to follow Jesus. Well, they're hunting together, and they're looking for ducks. When all of a sudden, the lost guy looks at his friend and said, hey, I'm just trying to figure this thing out. You're a Christian. Maybe you can help me out with this. I don't really understand the temptation thing. Because you're a Christian and yet you're always talking about how the devil's coming after you and how you're tempted to sin and tempted to do things you shouldn't be doing. And I just don't really understand that because I'm not a Christian. And I'm not a Christian and yet I never feel tempted. I never feel like the devil's whispering in my ear and trying to get me to do things that I'm not already doing. I don't get that. So can you explain what that means? And the, the other guy, the, the, the saved guy, looks at his buddy and he said, okay, here's the example I'll give you. Imagine that we're sitting here, we shoot two ducks. One duck falls dead on the water, the other duck falls on the water and keeps flopping around. Let me ask you a question. Which duck are we gonna go after? He said, well, that's pretty obvious. We're gonna go after the duck that's flopping around. Everybody knows that. And he said, exactly. The devil does the exact same thing. You see, the devil knows you're already dead in the water. But that's why he keeps coming after me. He keeps coming after me because I'm not dead in the water. Listen, it's the same with temptation. If the devil is after you today, it's not a sign that you're bad. It's a sign that you're alive. It's a sign that there's still hope. If the the devil's not coming after you, it's most likely a sign that you're already on his team. You're already going in the same direction that he's going, and so he's not even going to waste his time with you. You're dead in the water. But can I just tell you, if you're dead in the water right now, you can still give your heart to Jesus. You still have an opportunity to turn around and follow Christ and make him your Lord and your Savior. But can I tell you, if you do that, the devil's coming after you. So just be ready. Listen, the better friends you are with Jesus, the greater enemies you become with Satan. Let me tell you something else about temptation. You ready for this one? Temptation is amplified in weakness. Temptation is amplified in weakness. We see that beginning in verse two. It says, after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Then the tempter approached him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. So get this picture in your mind. Jesus hadn't eaten a thing in 40 days and 40 nights. How many of you, by a show of hands, have ever gone 40 days and 40 nights without eating any food at all? Anybody? Not a whole bunch of us in the room, right? A bunch of y'all haven't gone 40 minutes without eating something in a long time, I can tell. But the Bible says Jesus had gone 40 days and 40 nights without putting any food in his mouth. And look at the Bible. You see what comes next? I believe it's the most obvious statement in the entire Bible. It says, after that, he was hungry. Well, yeah, he was hungry. Been 40 days and 40 nights. You better believe he was hungry. But mark it down. Listen, when you are hungry, you become vulnerable to temptation. Everybody, everybody who's hungry, say amen. Right? I mean, it was one. When you're hungry, you become vulnerable to, to temptation. You don't believe me? Check this out. I give you a challenge this week. Go two days and just fast, okay? Don't eat a single thing. Two days this week. And then go grocery shopping and just see what happens. <laughs> Let me say, you can be the healthiest person in this room. You could be working out every single day. If you try this this week, you're going to find donuts in your buggy. I promise you. There are going to be ding-dongs and Twinkies. It's going to look like you're sponsored by Little Debbie or something. But it's going to happen. But that's what happens when we're hungry. But on the other hand, check this out. If you go have a big steak dinner, I'm talking about a big meal, you are busting at the seams, and then you go grocery shopping, guess what's gonna happen? You're gonna probably spend half as much money, and you're gonna make way wiser decision on what goes into that buggy, are you not? That's because when you're hungry, you're vulnerable to temptation. Temptation's voice is amplified in those moments. Right here, Jesus wasn't full, he was hungry, probably starving, and Satan challenges him in that moment, and he tempts him. And how does he do it? Read the text. He said, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. He said, if you're the son of God. I I don't know about you, but if I'm Jesus in that moment, I'll be like, if? What are you saying, if I'm the son of God? I'll show you I'm the son of God. Poof, French loaf, right? I would have busted it out right there in front of everybody. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't give in to temptation. 
Maybe you're wondering, man, why is it even a big deal in the first place? I mean, why not make bread? If you're hungry, why not? I mean, you can do it, obviously. Why not? Why not just do it? There's nothing wrong with bread or making bread or eating bread. You're exactly right. There's nothing wrong with bread. There's nothing wrong, unless you've got celiac. There's nothing wrong with it, <laughs> unless you're gluten-free. But, but there is something wrong with eating with the devil. There is something wrong with eating on the devil's terms. Just ask Adam and Eve. There's nothing wrong with apples unless that apple is being offered by the devil. If that is the case, listen, that apple is automatically off limits. Jesus was hungry here and he didn't give into temptation. But look at what verse four says. He answered and said, it is written, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so he just rears back and hits the devil right in the mouth with this quote from Deuteronomy and I love it. Because he reminds us here that even in our weakness, we can be strong if we rely on the word of God. In other words, when you're hungry, when you're weak, when you're empty, God tells you, fill yourself up with the word of God, the truth of God, and he will sustain you and he will pull you through. So when you're hungry, you become vulnerable to temptation. What else I want you, this is something else I want you to see is that when you are isolated, you also become susceptible to temptation. Not only when you're hungry, but when you are isolated. Listen, Satan's voice is much louder when we're alone. Somebody say amen to that, right? Have you ever experienced that before? You're all by yourself, and now all of a sudden, temptation's voice is louder than it has been the rest of the day. Proverbs 18.1 says, one who isolates himself pursues selfish desires. He rebels against all sound wisdom. I think we've got to take that seriously. When we're alone, when we're weak, the Bible says that temptation's voice is amplified in our weakness. In this story, Jesus was isolated. He was hungry. And the Bible shows us that when we are isolated and we're, when we're empty and when we're hungry, we become more susceptible to the voice of temptation. So what does that tell us? I believe it tells us two different things that we need to take note of. Tells us, first of all, we need to find ourselves in Christian community. We need to find ourselves surrounded by men and women of God that push us closer to the Lord, that, that, that challenge us in our walk with Christ. It tells us that if it's dangerous for me to walk alone in isolation, then I need to be responsible, taking heed of the warning, and I need to surround myself with people of God. Secondly, it tells me that we need to fill ourselves with the word of God. Lord tells us that it's dangerous to try to navigate this life, navigate this world with an empty tank. Therefore, we need to continually fill ourselves with the truth of God and the promises of God. Jesus tells us don't live on bread alone. In other words, he's saying you cannot survive this life in your own power or by your own strength. You need the word of God in your life. See, James understood that. He understood that, that temptation was designed to drain you. Temptation was designed to destroy you, to, to get you off the path that the Lord intends for you to be on. But on the other hand, the word of God was designed to provide you and to fill you and to strengthen you and to grow you up. You see, it's designed to, to be something that sustains you in your journey. And so James is writing these early believers so that they would understand how dangerous temptation may, really is. He's saying, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the word of God. Don't do this on your own or you will be taken out. And he goes on in this text to provide that truth. And he uses three different analogies to reinforce this message. I want you to get this today. The first analogy he's gonna use is this. He said, temptation is like a sporting event. Temptation is like a sporting event. And we're gonna read that beginning in verse 12. He said, blessed is the one who endures trials because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. This is a picture of a competition or a sporting event. By a show of hands, how many of you grew up playing sports? And so you understand. The ones who are raising there, you get, the, you get this picture. It's a picture of several different teams, several different participants. And he's saying, in the end, one of them is going to win the crown. One of them is going to win the trophy. One of them is going to be considered the winner. Everyone else is going to be considered the losers. At least that's the way that it used to be. 
When the Bible was written, there were such things as winners and losers, right? Before participation trophies and before they stopped keeping score. But anyways, that's the way that it was written. But what he's saying is, in the end, there's going to be a winner. Somebody's going to win the crown. Somebody's going to win the trophy. Today, in the NFL, if you are the best team in the NFL, you're going to win the Lombardi trophy. Today, if you're the greatest college football player in America, you're going to win the Heisman. If you're the best hockey team, you're going to win the Stanley Cup and so on. That's the language that James is using here. And he's saying life is like a sporting event. You're going to wake up in the morning and this is going to be a competition. It's going to be a game. He said you're going to take the field and you're going to do battle against Satan and all of his minions. And he's going to come at you with everything that he has and his goal is to get you to lose. He wants you to lose. And he said, in order to make you lose, he's, gonna, he's going to tempt you. He's going to tempt you to do things you shouldn't do. He's going to tempt you to be a part of things you shouldn't be a part of. It's a part of his strategy, a part of his game plan. But James tells early believers, just because you're tempted doesn't mean you have to lose. You can, you can get beyond the temptation. He says, blessed is the one who endures trials. That's James's way of saying, hey, don't quit in the middle of the game. Don't let him confuse you. Don't let him persuade you to do things that God doesn't want you to do. Don't let Satan beat you today, but endure to the end and keep fighting with the power of almighty God that is within you. You say, why? Read it. Because when he has stood the test, he will receive the trophy. He will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. In other words, when temptation comes, and it's going to come, you've got to remember, you can still win. You have access to the power of Almighty God. You can tap into supernatural power, and you can fight back, and you can be seen as victorious in the eyes of God if you endure to the end. And so James says, listen, temptation is like a sporting event. But he goes on to say, it's also like catching a fish. Temptation is like catching a fish. Look at it, verse 13. No one undergoing a trial should say, I'm being tempted by God, since God is not tempted by evil. And he himself doesn't tempt anyone. Verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. Right here, right here James reveals it. He's got a little bit of redneck in him, right? He starts using this hunting, fishing language that most people didn't use in this time. But, but he's reminding us that that temptation is kind of like catching a fish. And he reveals that Satan himself is a crafty fisherman. And we are like dumb fish. Here's what James knew about fishing. He, he knew that certain baits caught certain fish. He knew, man, if you throw a plastic worm out there, there's a good chance you're going to catch a bass. If you throw a cricket out into the water, there's a good chance you're going to catch a brim. If you put stink bait in the water, there's a good chance you're going to catch catfish. And what James is reminding us of here today is that Satan has a full tackle box. He has access to every kind of bait and lure imaginable. And he knows exactly what kind of bait catches certain fish. And he knows exactly what to dangle in front of your nose to try to get you to bite. And it's not going to be a worm. It's not going to be stink bait. He uses different things for different people. For you, he may dangle a little bit of pleasure. For you, he may dangle pornography. For you, he may dangle some kind of prosperity. All kinds of baits. But he has access to every single one of them. And you know what? The baits that he will dangle in front of your nose will look absolutely harmless at first. They'll look harmless. But what we forget is that every bait that entices us has a hook in it. Every single bait that he entices us with has a hook in it. And once we're hooked, we've seen it over and over again. Satan just starts to reel us in. And that's what James is warning us about. He's like, temptation is just like that. It's like catching a fish. And we have to realize as believers that he is a very crafty fisherman. So he says temptation is like a sporting event. It's like catching a fish. The third analogy he's going to use here is this, that temptation is like having a baby. It's like having a baby. We read about that in verse 15. It says, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin 
And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. So he walks us through this entire process and he says it's going to start with a desire. You read that right there in verse 15. After desire has conceived. And now what he's not saying here is that all desires are bad. And I think that's pretty obvious. God has given us all natural desires. You have the desire to eat. And if you don't eat, you're going to starve to death. You have the desire to rest. And if you don't rest, you're going to die of exhaustion. You have sexual desires that are natural and necessary in order for us to procreate as the human race. Therefore, the problem isn't necessarily with the desire. The problem comes when those desires are addressed outside of God's will. And when they are acted on outside of God's way. The problem is we've got a desire and all of a sudden we act on those desires and we pervert those desires and we participate in those desires in ways that don't honor the Lord. So he says temptation, it begins with a desire, but if you don't react in the right way, it's going to go to the next step, which is deception. It's deception. Verse 14, but each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. And so once again, it's like the fish that takes the bait. He saw the bait, he couldn't resist the bait, and so he attacked the bait, and as a result, he's got a hook in his mouth. And he's being drawn away to a place he didn't intend to go. So James says it starts with a desire, then it goes through deception, but then the third step is disobedience. It's disobedience. Verse 15 says, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And so when we begin to desire something outside of the boundaries of God and when we take the bait, what it's saying is what started with a desire has now led to disobeying God. You read about that. It's it's the definition of sin. Look at verse 15. Verse 15 actually tells us what the next step is. It says, and sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. And so here, something that started with a simple desire has now led all the way to death and destruction. It's a pretty strong word. It's a pretty strong warning to us today. It's a pretty strong warning to you today. You say, me, yeah, to all of us. Listen, temptation is everyone's problem. It's easy to walk into church like you're holier than thou, like you got all your stuff together, but temptation is one of those things that all of us have in common. The devil wants to take every single one of us down, therefore he tempts us to do things that God doesn't want us to do. And so this is one of those things that affects every single one of us. It's one of these these subjects in the Bible that really impact every one of us, no matter if you know Jesus as personal Lord and Savior and you've known him for a hundred years or if, if you have no idea who the Lord even is. This is something that all of us can relate to. It's all of our problems. So I think we need to take it seriously. Let's personalize it real quick. Let me ask you, What is your temptation today? What is the bait that the devil continues to just put in front of your nose? What is he trying to get you to bite on these days? Whatever it is, let me just tell you, temptation can be overcome. You can still win. You don't have to be taken out time and time time and time again. You can actually win this battle through the power of God in your life. You can overcome the temptation in your life. You can be victorious. But let me tell you this, you will never overcome temptation until you truly believe that Jesus is better. Don't miss this part. Until you truly believe Jesus is better than blank, whatever the temptation is in your life. Until I believe Jesus is better than blank, you'll never be able to defeat the temptation in your life. Until you believe Jesus is more valuable than this, Jesus is more beautiful than this, Jesus is more necessary than this, guess what? Until you get to that place, you will never be victorious over your temptation. You will continue to fail and you will continue to fall. The Bible tells us that you will continue to fall into temptation if you continue to be filled with sin. Romans chapter 7 verse 20 says, now if I do what I do not want, I am no longer the one that does it, but it is the sin that lives in me. You know what that says? It says that if I'm filled with sin, that Satan has the ability to dictate and determine the direction I go. The sin is controlling me. But on the other hand, the Bible says if you're filled with the word of God, if you're filled with the wisdom of God, if you're pursuing almighty God, then you have the ability to be directed by the spirit of God. You don't have to let sin win in your life. 
day in and day out. You don't have to continue to fall and continue to fail. You can be victorious through Christ. Do you get that today? Do we understand that today? That he can give us the victory we we long for. But listen, only God can deliver us from temptation. Only God can do that. Matthew 6, 13 says, and do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is a cry saying, God, deliver us, rescue us, allow us to be victorious from this temptation in our life. And can I tell you, he is quite capable of doing that in your life. You say, how do I do it? Let me give you two things you have to do. Number one, you have to run away from temptation. You have to run away from temptation. Paul said in 2 Timothy 2, he said, flee from youthful passions. Flee. You know what that word means? Run. He says, when it comes to the temptation you're facing today, the only option ought to be run away. He didn't say hang around. He didn't say flirt with it. He said, get out of there. Run away. You know what that tells me? It tells me if, if, if my smartphone is a temptation for me, then my job is not to carry that smartphone and hope that the temptation will leave. My job is to get rid of the smartphone. He said, flee, which means it's time to get a flip phone. You might go bag phone and just go old school, right? Retro bag phone. But what he's saying is, if you continue to carry the thing that tempts you, you're disobedient and you're gonna fall. You're gonna fail. If the internet is a problem for you, it's time to unplug the internet. It's time to take the computer out of your bedroom. It's time to take the computer out of your house. If you cannot control yourself and make decisions that honor the Lord with the internet in your home, th- then go to Starbucks, man. They have free, free Wi-Fi, and you're not going to act like a fool in Starbucks around a bunch of other people. So get rid of it. If your TV is a problem, if it's a temptation in your life, you know what the Bible says? Flee. Get rid of your TV. It's time for it to find another home. Craigslist that thing. Somebody will pick it up today. But that's what he says. Over and over again, he says, flee. Don't allow the devil to have a foothold in your life. And if you allow the thing that tempts you and moves you away from the Lord to be present in your life, you're just allowing him the opportunity to get at you day in and day out. So he tells us, run away from temptation. But you can't just run away from temptation. There's a second thing you gotta do. You gotta run to Jesus. You can run away from temptation all day long. You're gonna find more temptation, more temptation. That's why we've gotta run to Jesus. Listen, for a brief moment in the world's history, God humbled himself and he made himself like us. Jesus was tempted like we are. He suffered the way that we suffer. And I say that to remind you that we serve a God that is sympathetic to where we are. He's understanding of our position. He's a God that relates to us and knows what we're going through. He's a God who continues to show us mercy and grace and love. He's a God that says, I've been there, I've done that. I've been hungry before. I've been weak, I've been isolated, I've been tested. I know what it's like to have to persevere through difficult trials. I've been there before. And not only have I been there before, but now my job is to walk with you as you endure the same thing. Listen, we serve a God who desires that from us. He wants to walk with us. He wants to see us endure to the end. He doesn't want to see the devil claim victory in our life. He wants the victory to be in Christ Jesus. And when we walk away from temptation, when we run away from temptation and we chase Jesus with reckless abandon, that victory becomes a possibility in our journey. 